Brian Hall is Dean of the College of Contemporary Liberal Studies and Professor of Liberal Arts at Regis University. He is the author of An Ethical Guidebook to the Zombie Apocalypse, a book that uses a world-ending crisis to teach moral philosophy in an accessible and entertaining way. In this episode, we discuss ethics, both in the fictional context of an ungoverned, zombie-infested society, and in the very real context of the COVID-19 pandemic. We explore the moral considerations of wearing masks, allocating ventilators and tests, refraining from hoarding food and supplies, among other ethical questions in the face of an international crisis. Take a listen. Welcome to the Bloomsbury Academic Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Morofsky, and uh, today I'm speaking with Brian Hall, the author of An Ethical Guidebook to the Zombie Apocalypse. Um, I really loved this book. I thought it was a super accessible way to discuss theories around moral philosophy, which I think can feel a little esoteric to people. Um, unfortunately, Brian, it seems like your book is a little bit more applicable than you know, in a way that none of us could have ever really expected. So I'm really interested to hear about moral philosophy in the context of zombies and the apocalypse, but also how it sort of relates to our current climate, which is at the time of this recording, we're all kind of in the thick of COVID-19. A lot of us are self-isolating. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to talking to you today. Well, thanks so much for the for the kind words of about the book. And yeah, I mean it's it's really surprising. It's one of these examples where um, you know, it seems like life is imitating art, but there's certainly some things that I talk about in the book that uh unfortunately seem to be coming to fruition. Mm. Well, we're gonna definitely dive into that. But first things first. Uh, why zombies? Why? What intrigues you specifically about zombies, and why do you think that you know people in general are we as a society are so into zombies as a as a narrative? Well, I, I think that most people are, are fascinated by, or, or perhaps horrified by, um, thinking about how they would act in the absence of any kind of civil society, and zombies provide a really nice post apocalyptic vehicle. Uh, for us to talk about ourselves and how we would behave without any kind of external authority, so police, military, etc. I think that the biggest irony of most zombie fiction is that we really have a lot more to fear from the living uh, than we do from the undead. The, the philosophical question, I think, though, is, is not how humans would act in the absence of any kind of external authority, which is what most uh, zombie fiction and post-apocalyptic fiction deals with, but rather the philosophical question is how they ought to act in the absence of that external authority. And this is something that philosophers have been thinking about for thousands of years. Uh, everything from Plato's Ring of Gyges in the Republic uh, to Thomas Hobbes' State of Nature in Leviathan um, introduce ethical concepts by considering human beings without any form of social constraint. The zombies are really just a means to an end um, to make the philosophy more digestible, if you will. Uh, whereas lots of people are fans of zombie horror, and, and myself, I, I would count myself in their number, uh, moral philosophy can be a harder sell. Uh, like you were saying before, it, it can be you know, somewhat abstract and inaccessible. Uh, the analogy I use when I'm talking to people about the book is that if you want a child to eat their broccoli, you slather it in cheese. And in this case, the moral philosophy is the broccoli and the zombies are the cheese. Somebody who's a fan of zombie fiction should really be able to enjoy the book on that level. Um, as you mentioned, there's all of these field exercises that utilize the genre conventions of zombie horror. Uh, but you'll also learn a lot about philosophy without being the worse for wear. So let's talk about these field exercises a little bit. Um, so you, you divide your book into all these different concepts, these theoretical concepts within moral philosophy. And in uh you know, one of the chapters, for instance, you talk about uh, the idea of an objective moral value. Could you talk about the idea of moral value in general using the exercise that you included in your book? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe I'll just talk about the, the first field exercise uh, from the first chapter. Um, and, and it deals with cultural relativism. Um, and this is the view that the moral value is just a matter of cultural opinion. And these opinions differ from culture to culture. 
Uh, and often in, in philosophy classes, we present the view by talking about ancient cultures. Uh, so, for example, uh, the late philosopher James Rachels, in a really famous essay on cultural relativism, uses a story from Herodotus's histories, uh, where Darius, who's the king of Persia, is asked to adjudicate between the Greeks and the Calatians. Uh, the Greeks burn their dead while the Calatians eat their dead. Of course, each thinks the practice of the other is morally abhorrent. And if you're a cultural relativist, that's really the end of the story when it comes to moral value. And it's easy enough to zombify a story like this, you know, where you're talking about burning the dead versus eating the dead. And, and an early version of my chapter did just that. Um, at the end of the day, however, I decided to throw that out and go with a more contemporary example. Although the stories of cultures that students don't belong to or that the reader doesn't belong to can help them to understand cultural relativism, I don't think it really resonates as powerfully as it could because students or readers don't have any skin in the game. Uh, we're not ancient Greeks. We're not ancient Galatians. When I was writing this book um, last year, it was really at the height of the immigration debate in this country. And while the Trump administration was enacting ever more draconian and cruel policies at the southern border, and the first field exercise or short fictional story uh, uses this as a jumping off point to turn the tables and examine cultural relativism in a way that's going to better resonate with a contemporary, and I think especially American audience. Uh, instead of those south of the border fleeing north to escape violence and hardship, as happens in our actual world, uh, in this fictional world, the zombie infection originates north of the border, and quote-unquote gringos are fleeing south. Um, there are very different attitudes on the value of these gringo lives north and south of the border. Whereas these lives have moral value north of the border, they absolutely lack this value south of the border. And if you're a cultural relativist, there's no objective fact of the matter when it comes to the value of these lives. And I wanted that conclusion to really hit home with the reader. Uh, and, uh, you know, several weeks ago, uh, when stories were coming out that the Mexican government was talking about restricting travel from the North based upon how widespread COVID-19 was in the United States as compared to Mexico, um, you know, really, really made me laugh because it's, it's a good instance in this case of life imitating art, imitating life. Right. And it totally parodies the way that we've been talking about, you know, uh, Latin Americans, me Mexican immigrants, Central American immigrants, specifically the hostility and the xenophobia kind of flips on itself in this in this context. And, and it is kind of funny to to think that they're like kind of talking about Americans the way that conservatives would talk about them. I don't know, this whole idea of moral or uh, cultural relativism uh, rings personally for me just because I uh, my background is in anthropology. And so <laughs> the first thing that you learn in an anthropology class is like when 101 is, is cultural relativism. My issue with it sometimes is that I do think that because we're taught that other societies have a different or a relative moral framework, it ends up censoring them in the sense that they're afraid to like criticize other cultural contexts in with the fear of being accused of something like ethnocentrism or racism. Um, that's probably a, a different tangent, but yeah, that's just... Well, <laughs> and, the, and these are some of the worries that I talk about in the book once we get to kind of the philosophical prose section uh, that unpacks that short story is, you know, what are what are some of the consequences of accepting cultural relativism? Um, you're, you're not allowed to, to criticize other cultures. It would be mere hubris on your part to do so. Um, you can't criticize your own culture, right? Uh, and there's also no such thing as, as moral progress if you're a cultural relativist, because what could you be getting morally better at as um, a society from the moral standpoint if there is no moral standard outside of the opinions of that society? Right. In some ways, it's almost intellectually lazy to just say, oh, okay, well, they're different. Let's just leave it at that, because if we touch it, then 
we are doing something wrong. We're being, we're offending somebody. And I, and I think that the way that it's often presented in philosophy classes can encourage that kind of laziness because again, you don't have skin in the game with the collations and the ancient Greeks, but when you put it in terms of the contemporary immigration debate, all of a sudden, right, people have skin in the game. Um, and the, those conclusions resonate, I think, a lot more and people find them to be more problematic than they would when you're dealing with a culture that you uh, have no investment in. So have you given that specific field exercises to some of your students or something similar to them? Like what, how are the, how are the youth of America reacting to these kinds of sure. uh, field exercises? Well, um, the, the last time I taught it was actually when the book was in draft form and I was still at uh, St. John's University in New York. Uh, and I, I test drove the course in an honors uh, section of introduction to ethics. And it was a very diverse class, just as St. John's is a very diverse university. Um, and, you know, you had, you had people on, on all sides of that debate in the classroom. Um, I think that for some of the more conservative students, they found that it was heavy handed um, for the, the students who saw what, you know, this was relating back to with the immigration debate. A lot of them came up to me, you know, after the class or, you know, um, or, or wrote me notes saying how much they appreciated, um, you know, having the shoe put on, on the other foot, so to speak. Um, but I think that for, for everybody in the class, and this was really the reason that I did it, um, they were much more invested in these questions of cultural relativism because of the ways in which it was presented in the book than they would have been um, had I been using examples of cultures that they didn't belong to. Totally. Which kind of segues in, is a nice segue into one of my other questions. I mean, so when we think about the United States specifically, but, you know, in our globalized world, I think so many countries now are made up of a plurality of people that, you know, places like Sweden are not nearly as homogenous as they once were, um, but particularly the United States, which is like based on this whole idea of, you know, diversity and being for everybody. It's so hard when when there's all these kind of competing moral frameworks at play, it's sort of hard to think about what the contract or like what the relationship between the United States government should be with its people when its people just want completely different things. Um, and, and in your book, you bring up Hobbes. I think a lot of people here are very familiar with Hobbes because, you know, especially in the context of the, the United States Constitution and, you know, our ideas of inalienable rights and limited government. Um, and, and via Hobbes in your book, you, you say, you quote, the state of nature, people living on their own, i.e. people living on their own without the protection of government is a state of war. Um, and I know that we still have a civil government. Even though we still have a government, I guess the the coronavirus has really revealed to me all of the ways that the U.S. was was already kind of living in crisis, um, and it made me curious how what you feel, what you believe the United States moral cron- uh, moral contract is with its citizens. How have they enforced it, and do you think that COVID nineteen revealed any sort of inadequacies in that contract? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned mentioned Hobbes and then, you know, the relationship to uh, the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights, um, Declaration of Independence. I mean, when it comes to that language of inalienable rights, I, that actually comes from uh, John Locke, who's uh, who's responding to Hobbes. Uh, and so when, when Locke is writing the Second Treatise on Civil Government, it's very much meant as a uh, philosophical critique of Hobbes's view and Leviathan. Um, and that's, that's the language that I think, you know, along with Montesquieu, with like the separation of powers and so forth, you know, really serves as a philosophical foundation for American civil government. Um, but it does, you know, raise this question with, with Hobbes, at least, you know, where, where are we um, relative to being in a state of nature, what's the status of the social contract, um, you know, in 21st century American society? Uh, you know, and, and like you noted, we're, we're not quite in a Hobbesian state of nature uh, insofar as there's still a civil society and laws are being enforced. I think the, the real issue is the inequity uh, 
um, with which these laws are enforced um, and how individuals really aren't treated equally um, and are often discriminated against both by their governments as well as by their fellow citizens uh, for any number of morally irrelevant reasons. For example, the, the color of one's skin, one's gender, socioeconomic position, etc. cetera. Um, and these forms of discrimination can be structural. Uh, so, for example, minorities being disproportionately affected by this outbreak because of the weaknesses in the social safety net that you mentioned earlier, uh, but they can also be highly personal. So, for example, the two white men who executed Armored Ar- Arbery um, uh, in Georgia. Uh, so, I, I, I think that we can see it, you know, both at a kind of systematic structural level, but then that also being expressed in the very personal and individual actions of, of people. Yeah. I mean, what happened was, you know, unbelievably heinous. Uh, I mean, it, it shouldn't be surprising to anybody when white supremacy has gotten a full pass in the White House, but just... I mean, it's always gotten in pass, I think, in this country, but I think especially now it's legitimized in a way that it hasn't been before. But I, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting that you mention the ways in which COVID-19 or something like COVID-19, you know, disproportionately affects people of color or people who are working class or women, you know, all these people that are systemically oppressed by by any society, I guess I'm speaking specifically of the United States right now. Um, On the flip side of that, if they are being systemically, if they are having a systemically different experience of the apocalypse, be it zombie, be it COVID-19, do you think that things like class or race or gender affect an individual's moral obligation during this time? Uh, Yeah, I mean, and I I think... You know, one way of tying what, what I talk about in the book to COVID-19 is a theme that I keep coming back to in the book is that the virus doesn't discriminate like we do, uh, but yet our forms of discrimination can determine the disproportionate effects of the virus, you know, whether that's uh, COVID-19 or, or whether that's a, a zombie infection. Um, and so I, I think that you can see that uh, you know, both within the fictional context, but you you can definitely see it realized in in the world that we live in right now. Mm. Talking of like sort of moral obligation, I mean, are there are there? Do you have any thoughts about the way that people in general are behaving during lockdown? Are there issues? Um, as an addendum to that question, are there issues, moral issues that have come up during coronavirus that have surprised you? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can talk about uh, first just some of the moral issues that have come up that, that have surprised me and then uh, talk a little bit about um, people be- behaving during the lockdown. Uh, I have to say one of the things that's really surprised me is this whole mask wearing debate. And the question of whether we have an obligation not to risk the lives of other human beings when the sacrifice on our part is really negligible. Um, I didn't think that that would be as much of an issue as it's turned out to be. Um, there was a Washington Post poll though, that came out today that it was 80% of Americans uh, think that we should be practicing social distancing and that we should be wearing masks in public. So uh, that, thankfully, that doesn't seem to be the attitude of the vast majority of our fellow Americans. Um, but there, there is certainly a vocal minority. Um, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I think the book does do a pretty good job of anticipating the, the kind of ethno-nationalist scapegoating um, that would occur as part of a pandemic like this. Um, but as you yourself noted uh, you know, a few moments ago, American history also predicted as much. So we, we really shouldn't be surprised there. Um, as, as I've been locked down and, and thankfully locked down with my family, and so not by myself, uh, but I've been thinking a lot about how we cultivate moral virtue in social isolation, um, where so much of this for someone like Aristotle has to do with the ways that we act and react to others. Uh, and, and here I think technology has been a real boon. Um, people are able to continue to cultivate friendship, for example, through the use of Zoom. Uh, so virtual happy hours, texting, social media, 
uh, and the like in a way that we simply couldn't have done. A hundred years ago, when we were going through the 1918 flu epidemic, uh, I actually wrote a little piece on Aristotle friendship and the Shaun of the Dead PSA that came out a few weeks ago. I don't know if you saw that uh, Mm -hmm. for for my local newspaper, um, which was a lot of fun. (laughs) Uh, it's interesting. So you feel that the internet has been uh, has been a boon during this time specifically, or just in terms of cultivating? Mm, yeah, sorry. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Do you feel like it's good in this moment? I think it provides an, an opportunity for people to be connected in a way that would have been more difficult a hundred years ago. And so when we're thinking about cultivating more moral virtues that require. Um, sociability um, and the ways that we act and react to others, uh, that's where I think I think it can be really helpful. You know, at the same time, uh, social media can also be used and technology can be used in a way that cultivates vice. Uh, so, for example, the, the intemperance uh, that one often sees on social media, especially the kinds of things that people are willing to say to one another when there's some veneer of anonymity. Um, and, and that's a bad thing. Um, and so I think that you can see both kinds of extremes of human behavior uh, that when, when you look at the ways in which we use technology, but at least there's the opportunity, I think, to, to use technology to, to cultivate virtue in a time like this. I mean, and, and, sp- and I think specifically when I'm interacting with my friends who do live on their own um, and you know, of, of course, I try to leave them little gifts and, and call them and that type of thing. But being able to stay in kind of constant communication with them, uh, letting them know that, that, that I'm here and that I care about them and that I'm thinking about them. Or, um, you know, when it comes to your own family members as well, uh, who might be in isolation. So my mom is in isolation right now by herself. Um, and I, you know, try to maintain as much contact as I can with her. And, and certainly technology helps with that. Yeah, I I hear you on that. My mom's also uh, living alone in isolation. So I I totally agree on this front. In terms of communication, I think I'm I'm extremely thankful for the internet, obviously. Uh, I think that the, you know, the internet has provided a service in that way. I feel very complicated about this issue. Just, you know, I'm obviously, I'm a millennial. Like, I love the internet. (laughs) It's been a part of my life for pretty much my entire existence. But I do think, and like when I think about uh, social activism and cultivating moral behavior in general, I, I often feel like the internet makes it extremely easy to virtue, virtue signal your morals to people. And I think there's, this, there's actually an obligation to do so, at least in, in, in my circles, right? To, to say that you're against something, that you're outraged, outraged by the you know, whatever the controversial issue is of the day. But then I also find it because of that, because it's so easy to like signal your virtues, it actually makes it very difficult simultaneously to actually carry through with moral action. Because I don't know, you're like getting all these people, like you have to go on the internet, you have to perform your moral outrage. But I feel like it has almost replaced the actual act of, of, of collective action, if you know what I mean. Right. You're, you're basically able to, to signal your stand without having to take any meaningful action to back it up. Mm. Um, yeah. And I, and I think that, you know, and this gets back to where, um, you know, I'd say sp- especially social media can be somewhat pernicious and, you know, the ways that you just talked about, but also um, how, you know, to go back to somebody like Aristotle, that, that people can be really intemperate, uh, you know, for him, which is a vice in a way that uh, you you wouldn't be in face-to-face interactions. It seems like people are willing to say things to one another within a social media context that they wouldn't be willing to say face-to-face. Um, but I think for me, the way that I've used technology during this time that, that's been most meaningful are more those individual conversations that you have with people or with small groups of people that you care about and you're able to you know, maintain and cultivate those relationships in a way that would have been really difficult, again, 100 years ago. Um, so even though right, we call this social distancing, with technology, it doesn't have to be. It's physical distancing, but it's not necessarily social distancing. And if we're able to um, reduce that social distance between one another in ways that make us better human beings, then um, you know those are 
are, those are also going to be those ways in which uh, we're able to cultivate moral virtue in ourselves and others. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it really, it brings me back to what you just brought up, you know, about, well, the thing that surprised you about this moment, about people freaking out in this country about having to mask, especially, you know, like going to the grocery store or whatever. Um, I don't know if it surprises me that much because it kind of goes back to the, to the con, like, I might be misusing this terminology. My background is not in philosophy, so forgive me. I wonder if, you know, the contract that we appear to have with this country or like, maybe contract's not the right word, but I think like the whole mythology in this country, I feel like we totally, I mean, the things that we, like the things that we morally value, if I can say this, I think our selfishness, I feel like we idolize individualism and the idea of selfishness and the idea of being self-possessed, right? You know, the idea of like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps or social mobility, all of these things that I think are very, uh, very prevalent or very prominent in the mythology or the storytelling of what America is. And I feel like that kind of feeds into people's ideas of what they owe each other, right? They walk into a grocery store and they get furious that they don't have to wear a mask because it's 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 in somehow infringing upon their rights. But I don't know if people are like, where is that coming from? Like, it seems it should be so obvious to people like you and me that like the point is, is that you are wearing a mask so you don't kill other people. But I feel like we are fighting up against this this very pernicious narrative of of every kind of like a dog eat dog world, every man for himself. Like, I I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, I, and I, I think that you're right when you talk about the, the kind of egoistic strain that you find in uh, much of American culture and American society. And that probably informs some of this. Uh, There's also probably just some confusion over um, uh, negative and positive rights. So the, uh, negative rights, which are rights to non-interference or what I ought not to be doing to others versus uh, positive rights, which translate into obligations to others. You know, and in a case like this, um, when we wear a mask, what we're doing is recognizing the potential harm uh, that we could be doing to others. And that's why we wear the mask. Um, and, you know, for me, certainly that, that's, that's why I do it. It's a, a very small, negligible sacrifice on my part that can have a tremendous impact on the, um, the wealth and the health and the well-being of others. Um, and so, you know, for me, it, it's a recognition of that I ought not to harm other individuals in this way, or at least not to risk harm to those individuals. Uh, but yeah, you, you also have this other train of thoughts, um, which says, well, we, we ought to do whatever is on whatever we perceive to be in our own self-interest and that's, uh, ethical egoism. And it, and it's really, you know, a moral theory that's distinctive only in its lack of moral reflection. Uh, all you have to recognize is what your, what is in your self-interest and then your moral imperative is to do, you know, whatever that happens to be. Um, but that's a view that at least within the book, I, I try to go to great pains to explain the problems with um, and to contrast it with uh, the other moral theories that are on offer. So can you, can you expound upon that a little bit? What are some of the moral theories that might counter this sort of like egoistic, individualist moral framework? Well, I mean, take, take the idea that that some people have been offering that, um, you know, we might as well uh, just reopen the economy and, and everything uh, in it uh, because people are going to die anyway. Um, and uh, I think that the, those kinds of conversations that we're having around issues like that uh, mirror in a kind of funhouse kind of way uh, the differences between some of the moral theories that I discuss in the book. Um, and I don't think that either the, the Kantian position, deontological position, duty-based ethics, or the Aristotelian virtue ethics position, um, would share that 
you know, let's call it quote unquote conservative view. Um, the Kantian would hold that this position is treating the elderly, the working class, immunocompromised people um, merely as means to some other end that they've willed, an economic end. Uh, I think the Aristotelian would hold that it confuses wealth, which can enhance virtue, as if it were a virtue. Uh, but that's a category mistake that is itself the road to vice. And even though it might seem that a utilitarian would endorse this position, um, if one were to assume, I think falsely, that it produces the greatest overall good, that that position is still contrary to the altruism tenet of utilitarianism, uh, which holds that we need to weigh the good of others equally when our, with our own good when determining what we ought to do. Uh, it simply isn't the case that everyone's good is being weighed equally. Uh, the interests of the elderly, the working class, uh, people who are immunocompromised are not being weighed equally with the interests of you know, really a socio socioeconomic minority who most want the company economy to reopen prematurely. Um, you know, and again, going back to ethical egoism, even if they perceive that as being in their own self-interest, um, you know, that's not enough to, to justify um, the decision from an ethical standpoint. Um, it, it, it's really, I think, indicative of, of the lack of any kind of moral reflection. And if you, you know, want to bring it back to the, to the mask wearing debate, um, you know, when I choose not to wear a mask, um, in this case, I'm really not weighing the good of others uh, equally with my own good. I'm holding that my good is somehow more important because the sacrifice on my part is negligible in comparison to uh, the great amount of you know sickness, unhappiness, and death that I could potentially be causing to other people if I don't wear the mask. Mm. I mean, to an even stronger extent, one could say this is deeply dehumanizing. I mean, to not even consider... Or to consider elderly, working class, or immunocompromised people, for instance, as afterthoughts that shouldn't even be a part of the conversation about reopening the economy. I mean, it's just totally, it's a, it's a total erasure of their, of their inalienable rights. Um, I, I've found it it's sickening, honestly. But, uh, I mean, it kind of feeds into another, you know, conversation surrounding sacrifice and obligation. So, there, on the one hand, you know, there's all these like conservatives talking about reopening the economy and allowing, allowing the numbers of people dying to reach a, you know, a genocidal amount just so that they can serve, as you said, that they're, they're sort of prior, prioritizing their own good over others. So they're okay reopening the economy so that they can prioritize their own good. But in terms of the healthcare world, because this is sort of related to that. In terms of like hospitals, right? Because we have such a unsettling amount of ventilators and masks and tests in this country. We, we have, you know, we're number, <laughs> sorry, I feel like I'm going very hard on the States right now. <laughs> I swear I'm not always this critical, but um, yeah, I mean, clearly the U.S. is 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 very far behind in certain metrics for handling COVID nineteen in terms of ventilators and um, you know testing people. But that's also just because we do have a a lack of resources in a lot of these places. I mean, how what are the ethical considerations for hospitals that are overwhelmed by coronavirus and have to choose how to allocate their resources? Um, especially in terms of things like uh, utilitarianism, as you were just mentioning. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll try to tie it back to the book um, in, in the way that I answer this. But in the book, I, I talk about the tragedy of the commons um, in connection with contractarianism, which we were discussing earlier in relationship to, to Hobbes. Um, and the tragedy of the commons is the idea that individuals will take more than their fair share of a common resource if there aren't any kinds of external controls. Um, and I think that we see this now in the tendency to hoard, uh, as well as in the ways in which states have to compete with one another, as you mentioned it, over, over scarce medical supplies in the absence of any kind of federal coordination. Um, and it isn't 
I think in some of the ways, uh, the, the failure of the, of the social contract at that federal level to, to return to a, you know, an earlier question that you asked. Um, I also have a chapter in the book on the obligations of well-provisioned strongholds to defenseless survivors uh, who are fleeing the undead. And so this chapter deals with the various moral views on our obligations to the poor. Um, and to bring it back to utilitarianism today, I think we see many healthcare workers uh, living a version of, of the famous utilitarian Peter Singer's uh, greater moral evil principle, um, which is if you can prevent something bad from happening uh, without thereby sacrificing something of comparable moral significance, then you're morally required to make that sacrifice. Um, and although Singer used this principle to demonstrate how strong our obligations are to alleviate global poverty, which is the bad thing, um, today, the bad thing is patients dying of COVID-19. Uh, but many healthcare workers are willing to sacrifice until they contract the disease themselves and, and in some cases have even died from it. Yeah, but uh, and, and forgive me if you're not like actually f- too familiar with this, but I mean... <sighs> What are some of the considerations that they're actually, what are the tangible considerations that they're using when they're thinking about who to actually allocate resources to? Like, how do they actually determine this? Yeah, there's been some good um, articles recently on how hospitals are approaching the triaging of patients. And, you know, not surprisingly, a, a lot of the the thinking is utilitarian. Um, so the... Uh, trying to produce the greatest overall good through one's action. Um, So in cases where you can prioritize those who are most likely to recover and experience future happiness versus uh, those that are least likely to recover, um, considerations of age, you know, come into to factor as well. Uh, so I do think, you know, generally when it comes to, to triaging that you do see a lot of that kind of utilitarian thinking that's being reflected, um, you know, which is, which is different than how, you know, other moral views might approach it. So um, if you're a Kantian, for example, uh, it's never going to be morally permissible to treat someone merely as a means to achieve some other end. Um, and so, if you're, you know, taking away a ventilator that one individual who's a human person needs in order to aid another, um, even if aiding that other individual would produce greater overall happiness, um, if you're doing it in such a way that, um, you know, it undermines the the consent of the individual who's having um, that ventilator taken away from them, it would be morally impermissible from a Kantian perspective. And I don't think things have gotten uh, that that drastic perhaps perhaps they have um but those are the kinds of differences in um uh moral decision making between um a utilitarian and kantian just to give a couple of examples of moral Mm -hmm. theories just as a um as a quick aside is there a particular moral philosopher that you subscribe to like are you a kantian or is there yeah well, outside of, so this is really my first foray into, um, you know, not only writing about zombies, but uh, also writing about ethics, um, you know, in, in a systematic, um, you know, full length kind of book project. Now, all of my other writing um, has really been on Kant, but it's been uh, his metaphysics and his epistemology, not really his moral philosophy. Um, I mean, there are some things that I find attractive about Kant when it comes to um, the moral considerability of individuals um, and uh, this notion that we ought not to treat other human persons merely as means towards our own ends. Um but uh, at the same time, I think o- overall, I'm much more attracted to uh, the Aristotelian view of morality, which doesn't as much focus on what we ought to do. So adopting some sort of rule governed procedure for determining what we ought to do, um, but rather really thinking about the kinds of individuals that we ought to be and acting in certain ways that cultivate the right kind of character that's going to be consistent with human flourishing. Well, backtracking a little bit, you've, you've, you've touched upon this already, but, uh, you know, obviously this, like, this collection of moral theories applies to mostly to, to individual action, but clearly this is informed by our interconnectedness and, and the positions of power that we all hold or lack thereof. Um, do you, 
Do you feel like ethics, you know, we've, we've talked about how ethics can sort of change if you are in a vulnerable position or if you are, you know, oppressed by your society, for instance, on the, on the flip side of that though, like, do you think that people who have a responsibility for overseeing others have a different frame of ethics? Like for instance, uh, Dr. Fauci or, or even Trump, like, you know, I'm talking about them as individuals and not necessarily the government positions that they Mm -hmm. hold. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, do you think that the ethics change at all in that kind of situation? Um, Yeah, I do. I mean, I think that your position in society can have an impact on the kinds of moral obligations that you have. Um, And as you say, one acquires additional duties to others as one's scope of moral responsibility broadens. Um, And although some of these duties can be defeasible, So, for example, when choosing what states to send a scarce supply of PPE when you don't have enough uh, PPE for all of the states, um, you know, with somebody like like Trump, uh, you know, again, to return to utilitarianism, I think he's really the unreflective personification of what J.S. John Stuart Mill uh, called the selfish egoist. So, one, I'm kind of roughly quoting Mill here, devoid of every feeling or care, whose center is his own miserable individuality. Um, and, and, and although I think the kinds of decisions that you're talking about would be really taxing for someone with a, a modicum of moral reflection, you know, I, I think Fauci's a good example of that. For somebody like Trump, all these decisions are, are easily made based upon what he considers to be in his own immediate self-interest. So he's this kind of, you know, this per- personification of, of egoism. Um, now, of course, those same decisions also demonstrate how the selfish egoist is really self, self-stultifying because uh, a lot of the decisions that he makes ultimately undermines what would be in his self-interest. Can you th- talk about that tangibly in this case? Like, do you have an example of how something that Trump does, for instance, or any sort of self-serving egoist undermines themselves? Well, I mean... It- Trump, Trump might be the limiting case, which is a counterexample to all of the, you know, criticisms of egoism. But you know, for 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 most for most folks, if you act in a purely selfish, egoist way, you better keep your motivations to yourself, because if anyone ever finds out about them, um, you're you're certainly not going to be able to attain any of the social goods that you need to be happy. Um, you're not going to have friends. Uh, no one's going to trust you. Uh, you know, in, the, in put it kind of a post-apocalyptic world, no one's going to be willing to trade with you. Uh, it's likely that you'll get shot on sight because people will consider you untrustworthy because you'll be willing to, um, you know, take advantage of them whenever doing so is something that you perceive to be in your own self-interest. And so acting in a way where you're constantly just thinking about what's in my own self-interest um, can undermine you actually achieving um, the things that that would make you happy that that would you know really be in your self interest uh, in a, in a broader sense um, you know and I you know you look at somebody like Trump and you know he himself you know famous famously said uh, that if he were to shoot someone on Fifth Avenue he wouldn't lose a, a single supporter and you know that might very well be the case um, and so he may not may not be subject to uh, those same kinds of considerations but you know when you look at um, you know and I, I keep coming back to this you know most recent Washington Post poll where you know eighty percent of Americans are saying yeah you know wearing masks in public makes sense um, you know maintaining appropriate social distance that makes sense these are things that we feel like we're obligated to do and that these obligations are obligations that we have to our fellow citizens um, you know when they see someone like Trump who you know clearly doesn't care about any of those things and has you know really zero care for for anyone besides himself uh it's uh you know it's really difficult to see how those americans could continue to support someone like that um you know and for me you know that's kind of my biggest issue with trump i mean there's all kinds of things to be concerned with about him but from a from a moral and ethical perspective the the absolute moral vacuity at the essence of his being um is something that's uh deeply disturbing I mean, I think it's disturbing to the entire planet, or to most people at least. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm I, afraid I was... Actually, I stand by my harsh criticisms of the whole doctrine of selfishness in this country. That being said, I will say that 
you know, so many people who are responding with indignation to the idea of wearing masks are completely being manipulated by, you know, Fox News and Trump, which is is just a, one gigantic propaganda machine. And the way that they frame things, especially when this, this uh, when COVID-19 first kind of reared its ugly head in the States, I feel like the way that it was framed on Fox News was that it wasn't a big deal, that, you know, this was just another democratic ploy to win the White House. Um, and of course, his followers got angry when it was framed that way. I don't know. Maybe like responding with indignation to something that, as you said, doesn't actually require that much effort on our part, like mask wearing. Uh, it's it's clearly more complicated than people just being angry that they have to do something. I think that they're just they're almost existing within a different plane of like a they exist on a different truth plane, frankly. Um, Paul, and, and even if they're the loud, and even if they're kind of the loudest voices right now, um, or or the or the ones that are you know most covered in you know those venues that you mentioned, like Fox News, I don't think that it's really reflective of the opinions of the vast majority of Americans. And you know, I also think that you have daily stories, you know, especially in in the healthcare sectors, of people going well and above you know what would be reasonably expected of them from a moral standpoint um so really you know acting in a way that's super that, that that goes beyond what duty would require of them um or, or what their moral obligations would be um and at least for me i mean that look hearing about those people and, and not just them i mean there's also you know normal um americans who are who are going well above what um their, their moral obligations would be um, that, that that's the thing that I really, you know, try to focus on more. And that gives me much, much more hope. Mm. That actually reminds me, I agree that, you know, so many people are going well, uh, you know, above and beyond what they should be doing or, you know, are being asked to do in this crisis. Some people have to don that identity, whether they like, it or not they don't really have a choice I mean do you this is sort of off the cuff but like do you have any feelings about the framing of quote-unquote essential workers as heroes like I think that's another thing that's kind of come out of this that I've found that I've found a little surprising um you know the whole idea of uh, essential workers or you will, you know, even the whole idea of essential workers is itself a kind of like an ambiguous term. But like the people who have been con- constituted as essential workers in this case have been called heroes. Do you have any? Do you have any feelings about that? I mean, uh, the the thing that I find somewhat discomforting about that language is the, and, the, and this is you know again kind of uh, a, a specifically American thing, but our tendency to militarize. Um, any kind of challenge that we face. So, you know, we have, we've had traditional wars, you know, for much of uh, U.S. history, and we've been at war, unfortunately, almost all of it. Um, we, we also, you know, talk about a war on terrorism, um, even though that's not a war against a specific enemy. Um, now we talk about this this war on COVID nineteen. Trump calls himself a wartime president, um, and we uh, you know put every all of this within the, the context of this kind of you know military wartime mentality, um, which I, I think it in some way minimizes our responsibility collectively, but, you know, especially at the level of the federal government um, to have prevented us from getting into this to, to start with. And this kind of expectation of, you know, yes, we're, we're going to call them heroes, but just like soldiers in battle, that kind of sacrifice is something that is expected in due course in a military conflict. Um, but it didn't have to be this way. I mean, much like many wars are avoidable as well, but certainly um, the fact that, uh, you know, our, the total number of deaths as well as the, you know, per capita rates are, are so high in this country uh, in comparison to the rest of the world. And it just shows, um, you know, how, how little we did to prevent this from happening, but we could have. Um, so that's, 
that's the kind of concern I have about the, you know, kind of putting all of these, um, recontextualizing these discussions within a kind of wartime or warfare discussion is that uh, I, I think it's in many ways a category mistake um, that the, this isn't a war in the sense that, you know, the Second World War was a war um, and that it allows a lot of the individuals and institutions that were responsible for us being in the situation that we're in um, to sidestep and avoid that responsibility. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's a very intentional category mistake. It's, as you said, it, like, I, I agree that I think it has enabled the government, but just like, you know, your run of the mill person to absolve themselves of some moral responsibility. Cause they're just like, Oh, I've called this person a hero. I've made them feel important. I've, you know, validated their essential role in this quote unquote war. If we want to use that kind of invoke that kind of language. Um, but, you know, people who work at Trader Joe's didn't ask for this. No one, nobody asked to be on the front line. So I don't know. It's interesting. I know that a lot of people who work in the service industries were, uh, yeah, people who work in the service industry, so many of them are kind of pushing back against this, this type of rhetoric. Because- sure. I mean, someone who volunteers for the military is volunteering at least for the possibility um, that they may have to put their life on the line. Someone who gets a job at Trader Joe's or someone who's just a nurse in a hospital, they didn't ask for this. That's not what they signed up for. That's not what they volunteered for. And so, yes, of course, we can say that it's supererogatory, right? That it's going above and beyond the call when people continue to show up to work and to to do that work under dangerous conditions or without the right kind of protection. Um, but by by putting them in the same category as soldiers, we also um, we're, we're making a mistake because you know they're 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 not the same. They didn't they didn't choose this for themselves. Um, and it, uh, you know, again, I think minimizes the responsibility of government institutions and, and actors when we do reclassify all of these individuals um, as soldiers. Right. Yeah, I, I don't think there's really any answer to that in this context. I think that it's like what you were saying, that we've been at war for pretty much every single year that we've been a country. So I just don't think that we're going to be leaving the sort of metaphor of war anytime soon. Um, but the but, metaphor isn't necessarily the best way of dealing with the crises that we find ourselves within. So there, you know, there are wars, um, and then there are things that are not war, and we shouldn't treat the two of them as if they're identical, because it could actually make it much more difficult for us to overcome the problems that we're facing. Right, because then I think in your mind, yeah, it's exactly what you were saying, like certain people, like essential workers in this case, in this metaphor are on the front line, they're supposed to be the volunteer or the conscripted soldiers that put their bodies on the line and sacrifice themselves for the greater cause. Um, which is, it's so wildly, di- like, it's so wildly di- different from a literal war where people are actually volunteering to do it, as you said, um, than this. It's. Do you find... In that case, like, I agree, this metaphor is very damaging in this particular case. Is there, is there like another moral, I mean, maybe you don't have the answer to this. It's like, is there another metaphor for how you're thinking about this? Like, is there other kind of terminology that we should be using in, in lieu of things like hero, heroism or sacrifice? Um. Yeah, I don't know if I have something in particular in mind to substitute for that. I mean, what I would say again to to bring it back to to the the language of of ethics is that you know you do have people who are um, acting in ways that are that are supererogatory, that are morally praiseworthy, um, and they do deserve moral praise for what they're doing. Um, but you know, from a social and political standpoint, I think you have to step back and say, you know. What were the conditions that made that kind of sacrifice necessary in the first place? Um, and, and how are we responsible socially? Um, you know, or how, how can we reorganize, um, institutional structures moving forward, um, such that individuals don't have to make those kinds of sacrifices? And, you know, and I think 
what, you know, and this isn't what the book is about, but, uh, you know, if you look around the world and you see how uh, different societies have dealt with this in different ways, and some of them have been much more successful than others. I mean, we're, we're probably, um, if, if not the, the least successful society uh, in dealing with this, we're, we're, we're very close to being right at the, at the bottom of the list. Um, and so I think you have a bunch of other alternative uh, social and political models for, for how, how it could have been dealt with, with better. Um, and, you know, for, for, for me, ultimately, and it, it sounds like the, the same for you, uh, it, it comes back to um, a total uh, abdication of responsibility at the level of the federal government. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think in general... But I think that's becoming increasingly obvious to people. Like, even though uh, it's just, it's horrible. It's so scary. It's so uncertain what's going on. One way I've been thinking about it is that it is revealing all of these really harsh truths about the way we live, about the way that we frame things. Like what you were just saying, even the sort of the violence of framing things always as war in this country is something that we can kind of come up against in this context and and see the ways that it's actually like very damaging to the execution of a, you know, of a plan that will actually get us out of this pandemic. Right. So we clearly need to be having some very hard conversations with ourselves about, well, not just that, but it's like what I was saying before about the social safety net, the lack or the, faulty social contract that we have that has been totally shaped by social inequities and all that. Like, I think that, I don't know, maybe these, these horrible, these, these crises were obviously, uh, they were visible to some people, but I think that they've been made visible to all of us. We, we all see now that we're only, or maybe we don't all see this. I see now that we are all only as healthy as, you know, the most vulnerable person in our society. Yeah. And I also think, you know, and this, this does tie back to the book to, to some extent, I mean, especially in that first chapter where there's uh, all of these examples of magical thinking and, you know, thinking that somehow uh, the virus is tied to the whiteness of someone's skin within the context of my book. Um, and that makes you more susceptible to contracting it. Um, you know, what COVID-19 I think has really done in a, in a concrete and, you know, terrifying way has, uh, but useful way as well has illustrated the limits to magical thinking when people think that, you know, that this is just some kind of conspiracy or hoax. And then they have uh, a big party where they invite lots of people. And then all of a sudden you have a hot spot and you have, you know, a bunch of people who have gotten sick and some of whom who have died as a result of that event. Um, you know, it really illustrates that, you know, sometimes our most deeply held beliefs um, come into conflict with the reality of the world that we live in and our beliefs are proven to be false. Yeah. So we only have time for, for one more question. Um, I don't really want to end on the note of uh, we live in a failed state. Everything is <laughs> bad. <laughs> Nor do I. <laughs> um, so something I've been thinking about, you know, obviously since we've all been forced into quarantine, uh, we're all mental health has totally plummeted. So many of us, including including myself, have you know struggled with depression during this time. Um, in a world of this much uncertainty and anguish, how can we turn to something like moral philosophy to increase our pleasure and our happiness in society? I agree. I think that's a really good way to finish up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, going, going back to the Aristotle stuff, if, if you believe that rational activity in accordance with virtue is what constitutes human happiness, um, as Aristotle believes and as the book ultimately argues, uh, th- then that's what you need to pursue, even when you're in isolation. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I do think that technology can help with some of the moral virtue whose cultivation requires social interaction. Uh, so, for example, allowing us to more easily maintain our friendships. Um, but as we also discussed, technology can be used in a way that cultivates vice. So some of the, you know, real nastiness that you see in social media where, you know, people would never be willing to say these things to one another face to face. Um, and I think, you know, either in a zombie apocalypse or in COVID-19, uh, the 
the extremes of human behavior attract us in times of crisis. For someone like Aristotle, virtue is always the mean between two extremes of vice. Uh, and we're social animals, and we need to find ways of living in isolation that don't compromise our ability to live together again. Um, so to return to the kind of central theme of the book, if what we do to survive the zombie apocalypse, or COVID-19 for that matter, forecloses our ability to flourish as human beings, we might as well join the zombies who flourish at our expense. Uh, as I say at the end of the book, much better is it to be undead than the vicious living. Hmm. Well. Thank you so much again for being on the show. For everybody listening, I'm speaking to Brian Hall, the author of An Ethical Guidebook to the Zombie Apocalypse. Um, I will link uh, the webpage, the books page, webpage into our show notes. But um, yeah, thank you for once again for being on the show and for, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of assuaging me of my of my deep set anxieties about this country and about what's going on in the world right now. Well, I hope you feel better after reading um, a book about the zombie apocalypse. Uh, and it was a real pleasure talking to you. And thanks so much for the invitation. 